I don't venture out into the ocean very much. Sort of hard to do that in Missouri. But last July, a year ago last July, as some of you know, my wife and I took a 25th anniversary cruise, and I have never seen more beautiful, placid water. Here is one of 3,679 slides, <laughs> pictures I took, and that's the back of the cruise ship overlooking a blue Aegean Sea as uh, we were going into the harbor at Dubrovnik, Croatia. It was a trip of a lifetime. However, had the weather been a bit different, it might have been the last trip of a lifetime. It could have been like this. Other than that, it was a nice trip. <laughs> now, it's not an accident, it's not an accident at all that being on the sea, especially at night, in the middle of a storm, has been an image for us that reflects the storms of life that we, each one of us, no matter how young or old we are, will encounter. It's one thing to be in a storm in the Midwest, you see a tornado coming, at least you're on solid ground ground. You can run away, you can hide, you can do whatever, you can get away. When you're in the middle of the sea, tossing and turning, there is no stable land. You are vulnerable. And no matter whether or not you've been on a sea voyage before, we all have felt that. As a matter of fact, if you're old enough, 15 years ago, this very day, we felt it. It was such a traumatic experience that that is one of the few dates, or maybe it's the only date in U.S. history or world history, where you don't have to put a year after it. All you have to say is 9-11, and that's enough. Because that's when every one of us felt like we were on that cruise ship being tossed and turned totally vulnerable. That is when actually the world didn't change. No, the world didn't change. Our perception of the world changed. Because for most people in the world anyway, we knew, or they knew, that the world is a scary place. And that innocent people die. And that at times, evil seems to triumph. And no matter what your plans are, they can be torpedoed down to the bottom of the sea. They can come crashing down. 9-11 is... Uh, symbol of our communal experience of that type of stormy sea. It's also a reflection of the personal 9-11s that each of us can have, economically, relationship-wise, emotionally, physically. It's a fact of life. It is a fact of life that we are tossed and turned. And so, even though the, the stormy sea is a frightful thing that we can experience metaphorically. It can also be an instructional thing for us. I invite you to listen to what the disciples encountered one time in a stormy sea of their own. Later that day, when the evening came, Jesus said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd and took him in the boat just as he was. Other boats followed along. Gale force winds arose and waves crashed against the boat so that the boat was swamped. But Jesus was in the rear of the boat sleeping on a pillow. They woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're drowning? He got up and gave orders to the wind and he said to the lake, Silence, be still. The wind settled down and there was a great calm. Jesus asked them, why are you frightened? Don't you have faith yet? Overcome with awe, they said to each other, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. I do not understand Jesus' response 
to the disciples. It's puzzling. I do understand the disciples' response to Jesus sleeping. It's not fair. It's not fair. We are scared to death. We are scared to death, and here he is taking a nap. We want him to wake up and scream with us, right? Because there is company in abject terror. At least we have, through that company, a little bit of comfort because we'll all go down together. It's not fair that he's just sleeping through all this. So I understand that totally because we're all toddlers at heart. Not fair. It's Jesus' response that is puzzling. His, the first part of his response after the disciples awaken him, why are you scared? I don't know, Jesus. Maybe it's because there's this wave crashing over our boat. Maybe it's because pretty soon we're going to be cast into this Sea of Galilee and water's going to go into our lungs. We're going to suffocate a slow, agonizing death. We're never going to be able to see our friends and family again. We're going to be fish food. I don't know why we would be scared. The disciples were a sarcastic bunch, you understand. <laughs> then Jesus says one of the most insightful things that only Jesus could say gets right to the heart. He said, don't you have faith? And look at the little three-letter word, yet. Underline yet. Yet. Don't you have faith yet? You see, in the synoptic Gospels, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, especially in Mark, faith in Jesus wasn't so much about thinking right things about him. That comes later in John's Gospel, where it's later in church life, and it's important to have creeds about who Jesus is as a Son of God. But in Mark's Gospel especially, faith is following Jesus, when he, especially even when you don't know everything about him. It is simply being so enamored and entranced by him that, that you follow, just like those disciples followed, those old fishermen followed, just left the old life and followed him not knowing where he was going. And so when Jesus says, don't you have faith yet, he's implying, you've been with me this amount of time. Don't you yet believe from what you've seen? And up to this point, the disciples have seen Jesus cure lepers, paralytics, insane people, and people on their deathbed. He has, they have heard Jesus teach with amazing authority in such a way that thousands of people follow him. They have seen Jesus rebuke and stand up to and, and defeat the religious hypocrites and leaders of his day. And they have seen Jesus embody amazing grace in accepting the fringe of society, the outcast. They've seen all of that on dry land. And now, when it's scary, they, it's as if they have forgotten that. Don't you believe yet? It's almost as if, if you want to be able to be connected with Jesus in the storms of your life, you have to be attentive to Jesus on dry land when there are blue skies, sort of like it is today. There is a great misperception in Christianity today, and that's why I think it turns many of the younger generation off, the misperception that you lead Jesus and don't follow Him. That if you give $24.95 suggested donation to the latest televangelist that has secrets in this book that he will uh, give you for that donation, then all you have to do is not bother about Jesus in the other days of your life, but just think these nice things. And when you get in trouble in the Sea of Galilee or not your 9-11, then Jesus is going to come through for you. Sort of like a nice rabbit's foot in your pocket. That's bogus. Bogus with a capital B. That's, you know what rhymes with bogus of sorts? Blasphemy. 
I'm bad with poetry. <laughs> B, bogus and blasphemy. To think that you can treat God so objectively, get what you want. You're not following. You have other things. You have your own priorities. You just do the stuff that will get Jesus to come to you when you want Jesus to fetch something like safety. And Mark says, no. Don't you believe yet? My friends, we have, uh, this is I think the third week or so in the Deeper Discipleship series where we've talked about leaving the safety of the shoreline and following Jesus into the deep waters of adventure. We've talked about the importance of being able to do something concrete that will get you closer to Him, that will help you understand Him, that will enable you to, as Paul would say, have this mind in you which was in Christ Jesus, to have a heart that beats with compassion, to do something concrete. It's wonderful that you're in church now, but if you have not taken any responsibility for being part of a small group within this church, such as a Bible study, such as a mission project, uh, do it. Do it. Because that is the, the equivalent of being with the disciples around a campfire when they would listen to Jesus. And by being able to be with Jesus in the safe times, you will understand that his, and feel His presence in the times when you find yourself in the, in, in the storms. Because then, when Jesus is awakened by you, and he says, don't you have faith yet? Then you're going to remember back. And you're going to look at those times and suddenly it occurs to you that if you've been following him, not trying to lead him, but following him, then you understand and you can note where he's been active in your life every step of the way. Where he has delivered you from other storms you didn't even know it was him. Those times when he had that coincidence, that phone call, that gift, whatever it was, that person. He has always been there. And it is imperative to be able to be there for Him. And how you make the commitment not to use Him, but to follow Him and claim Him as your Lord every day. Do something concrete within this faith community. We, as a church, don't need you to do it. You, as a disciple of Christ, need to do it. To be able, with other brothers and sisters, to see the amazingness of this man Jesus as he leads you on in the adventure of your life. I am very glad that Brother Kevin picked the hymn that we sang just before the, the sermon and as a response to, uh, to the beautiful choir anthem. That hymn was written by Horatio Spafford. It was written a few weeks after the death of his children in a shipwreck in the North Atlantic on a dark, stormy night. As he went through that agony, he also reflected back. And in the midst of it, as he saw Jesus' faithfulness through the good times and the bad, he eventually was able to, to discover even hope in a difficult, tragic situation as the loss of his daughters. And in that process, he was able to see that Jesus was asleep in that boat during the storm, but it wasn't because Jesus didn't care. It was because Jesus ultimately was saying, you rest with me. Even in the midst of this, you rest with me. Because if you are with me, you have nothing to fear, and it will be well with your soul. Let me end this sermon with a postscript, a little Bible study note. In the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is not one, but Two stories. There are two stories about a dark, stormy night on the sea. They all record the one that uh, you just heard read to you. But a few months later, a few chapters later, in each of these Gospels, there's another time. 
There's a storm in the middle of the night on the sea, but Jesus isn't in the boat. This time, he is coming to them outside the boat. Peter impetuously, of course, says, can, can I come? And Jesus beckons Peter to leave that imagined security of the ship and walk toward him his real security. Perhaps as we live with Jesus, we will earn that trust in him that he can say to us, Come on, do you have faith yet? Come on, please stand.